this is Chris uh, and Brian's next to me. I'm going to lead off the presentation here, but uh, uh, yeah, we're excited about this work, uh, and uh, that's why we pushed it to the point where we're at right now. So we'll present to you guys the analysis of the ice to liquid ratios during freezing rain events and the development of an ice accumulation model, which has fallen out of that. So I'll get started here. The motivation for this research was there's really just been few studies that have examined ice forecasting in depth. Uh, there's been very successful out there. Um, so we wanted to elaborate on that and look into that. And um, I did some research on freezing rain in, in college and um, just really wasn't finding uh, much information out there. Uh, the most extensive and notable effort was probably produced by Cold's Region's uh, uh, Research Engineering Laboratory, uh, published uh, by Jones. Dr. Jones had some papers out there that talked about the physical processes taking place during ice accretion. Uh, and she developed uh, what were theoretical models. And so those were done in 96 and 98. And a lot of this work went into the Amer American Society for Civil Engineers. And they deemed this work uh, and the culmination of prior studies into a single quality ice load predictor. So their main, uh, main interests were uh, sort of the ice loads that would occur on uh, transmission lines and communication communication towers and what sort of thresholds need to be um, met there uh, for those structures to withstand some of these major ice storms. And what, get, getting into more of that work, um, we just really didn't find there was a lack of a robust cl uh, climatological database of, of ice measurements along with all these meteorological elements. Uh, like I said, the, uh, the work by Dr. Jones was theoretical, physically based. Um, trying to predict ice thicknesses. And it was only verified with a handful of unique icing events. And one of the models that she, uh, she saw that fell out of this was the simple model. Uh, and it assumes some physical relationships, uh, therefore, to be used as a forecast model. So we were wondering how, how accurate was this model and some of this uh, going on here. Uh, I know some of the uh, offices across the Weather Service has, have adopted this equation for their ice accumulation. So we wanted to look into that. We were also asking ourselves, <coughs> excuse me, do the meteorological elements that we forecast have an impact on ice accretion efficiency? And would these impacts be represented in the ice to liquid ratios during freeze, freezing rain events? So uh, we wanted to find a way to to measure this. And at first, we were thinking of a uh, setting up some sort of device to measure freezing rain, but it, it's a lot of complications there. So then we sort of stumbled onto the uh, ice sensor, which is uh, part of the ASOS system now. And uh, basically, this was turned on in, uh, for some sites in late 2013, disseminated around then, widespread. And what this uh, sensor does it measures flat elevated surface accretion uh, and you can see the the in the top right of the picture that probe there uh, basically vibrates and as ice accretes on that probe the frequency will decrease and then in turn that correlates to an ice thickness well first ice mass and then it's converted into ice thickness but we'll get into that <clears throat> every eight hundredths of ice that accretes on the sensor it goes through a melting cycle uh, just to, uh, to de-shed the ice and then repeat uh, again the, uh, the process. Uh, and then when this was tested officially with 1,500 hours of icing, so they were out in the field uh, actually taking measurements of ice and, and comparing it to the sensor, and we'll get into that. Like I said, widespread dissemination across the, the, uh, the, um, the cone is here by late 2013. So it's been in in operations for a couple winters, so we wanted to capitalize on that. There are a few limited uh, limitations associated with the sensor. Uh, one is uh, in, during this uh, de-icing recovery, if temperatures are near freezing, uh, this, the time to uh, allow the sensor to cool to build ice again uh, can, can cause some um, problems there, and you might lose some of the ice accretion, which actually is occurring. Uh, but it only accounted for 2% of the total hours, the total hours of being the 1,500 hours of testing. Another is clamping, and that's where ice bridges at the base of the ice probe 
and that accounted for 4% of the total hours. Uh, another issue is different drop sizes and that runoff of large drops uh, can occur, but that could happen with any various surfaces that ice uh, accretion uh, takes place. So, As far as the testing phase, uh, in the upper right, we basically had several of these sensors in uh, operations during the winter, and they would set this rack out here, which is uh, 1.5 meters above the ground, and they would would uh, measure ice mass and thickness during the uh, during these re freezing rain events, and they collected over 500 data pairs of cylinder ice mass and then this net frequency change, and that's what you see in the bottom left. Uh, so your net frequency change versus your mass, and the correlation came out to be a 0.98, which is pretty pretty good. So as the frequency would uh, decrease. It correlated pretty well with the increase in mass. Uh, in the lower right was a, this one specific event where the uh, ice observed matched pretty well with what the sensor was uh, measuring. Uh, there's one site here, the ASOS, is, uh, was not, it was a, a few miles away, so sort of a different environment there going on. That's why that didn't correlate too well. But the other uh, SRDC sites or sensors basically we were on site where, where this rack was where they were measuring. So we, we felt pretty confident with going into that that this was definitely a, a means of measuring ice in the field and then also using sort of uh, what the other meteorological elements that ASOS measures, wind, temperature, precipitate, the actual liquid, and things like that to sort of study that. So we wanted to focus purely on freezing rain and freezing drizzle. Uh, like I said, we, we looked at winters of 2013-14 and then last winter of 14-15. And uh, yeah, 650 ASOS ice sensors were operational and I like to stress geographically diverse. So we looked at freezing rain across the country. It didn't matter where this occurred, so uh, no biases as far as regional, uh, uh, regional trends are, are concerned here. And uh, we wanted to give a period um, to calculate the ice-liquid ratio where there was enough time for ice to actually accrete. You know, we can collect uh, five-minute observations through NCDC, um, but we felt that maybe uh, using like a 60-minute period uh, would allow for that ice to accrete and then sort of average out some of the elements over that period. And we looked at continuous freezing rain or freezing drizzle through that 60-minute period. This is nonstop precipitation during that time frame, and no precipitation, uh, no mixed precipitation types, so no sleet and no snow uh, and or rain. So purely freezing rain and freezing drizzle, uh, so no interruptions uh, during this time frame. Uh, we also single, uh, looked at basically liquid precipitation greater than or equal to 200, so we wanted to focus more on freezing rain um, as opposed to the, the lighter events, as well as looking at icing, which had no trace amounts, because we really couldn't calculate ice liquid ratios with trace amounts. So those are sort of the requirements there, and it could be it could begin in between an hour or at the top of the hour if we didn't, there was no biases there. Just since we had the five-minute observations, we looked at 60-minute periods, not top of the hour, end of the hour, anything like that. Uh, and uh, over the two winters, we collected 1,255 total 60-minute periods of ice accumulation. So we felt that was pretty robust uh, a number of uh, hours of freezing rain to really analyze things and, and break it down. Uh, so we move forward into that. Before I get started, I know there's a lot on this slide here. I uh, just wanted to focus, you know, on the different types of uh, sort of thicknesses that that are associated with freezing rain in the top left. You have your uh, elevated horizontal, uh, which is measured by the ice sensor, so your depth on a flat surface. And then your radial uh, ice thickness, they are utilized for trees and power lines. And essentially, you can have uniform or non-uniform, uh, but it, they all work out in the end there uh, to where you can figure out the mass. And uh, one thing that was done in the study testing the ASOS sensor was they were able to take the ice mass uh, measured on the racks 
and essentially um, derive uh, an equivalent radial thickness. And so once you have that, uh, the, there, then you then have a, a way of converting sort of what is measured by the sensor to what is potentially the ice thickness on, on trees and power lines. So that's what you see here. So if you measure, uh, there's basically a factor of 0 0.394 there. Uh, but theoretically, when you're measuring the mass and calculating the, the thicknesses, that's the most accurate way here anyway. Uh, I know theoretically there's a difference of pi, uh, but everything is based off the sensor. So it's a slightly different than the factor of pi there. But uh, the conversion is there, and uh, it's useful. Uh, in the study and in the forecast sense. So another one, which isn't really that the diameter ice thickness, it's sort of just the total ice. I, in looking through all the data and doing the lit review, <clears throat> it seems like a lot of measurements taken in the field and in storm data seem to be referring to the total ice thickness. So whatever the, the ice is minus the object diameter, basically. Uh, and then if you, you consider that to be twice the amount of what is a uh, uniform radial thickness. So that's where you get this conversion down here. Uh, and then your ground level of horizontal ice thickness, which is your roads and your sidewalks. And that's totally different than what is occurring on the elevated surfaces. So just wanted to, uh, to highlight that as we move forward here. So moving to the results here, and this is based on the um, just looking at the ice lake ratios here based on the 1,255 hours and then breaking up each different thickness here. And um, you generally see that your ice liquid ratios are less than one to one, uh, especially for your horizontal. And then once you get into your radial thickness, you're at, you are closer to a 0 0.4 or less as far as the majority. So there are some processes going on there that negatively impact ice efficiency and decrease these values from the expected ratio, which is closer to 1 to 1 or slightly above when you look at the theoretical conversions, basically. Uh, another thing to note is between the horizontal and the radial, there really isn't a lot of interquartile overlap, which sort of stresses the, uh, the differences between these two thicknesses, what is accumulating on flat elevated surfaces or the ASOS sensor and what is occurring on the trees and power lines. So you're taking that ice and all that liquid and basically spreading it around what is a cylindrical object as opposed to a flat surface. So that's why the differences show up there, and that's, that's what's going on. Um, but we found this very intriguing. Another sort of uh, thing that came out of the data was looking at the, the uh, sort of the time of day, and it looks like here in local standard time, that in the nocturnal hours, you have more freezing rain occurring or it's more likely to occur. Uh, and then as you get into the morning and then the peak heating, right in the early afternoon hours, you have a minimum in what is actually freezing rain occurring on these sensors that uh, was sort of interesting. And then you get an increase going into the nighttime hours. So this is probably due to the diurnal flux of uh, shortwave solar radiation and surface temperature that trends toward the minimum during the uh, nocturnal period there. So creating an environment more conducive to freezing rain and ice accumulation. We just thought that was a pretty good uh, correlation there with uh, that aerial uh, cycle of the uh, things going on and uh, something for a forecaster to, uh, to have in the back of the mind there. Like I said, we were going to look at each individual meteorological element and how those contribute to the ice-liquid ratios. Obviously, there's multiple factors going on, so sometimes your correlations aren't uh, strong. But we felt the trends in some of the data here that we, we broke up were uh, isolating each variable were pretty significant. So first start with precipitation rate. This was actually the best correlation that we found. Uh, and you can sort of see that trend uh, as precipitation increases, <coughs> excuse me, from left to right. You can see that the ratios also decrease. <clears throat> now there are some overlap, but you, you do get sort of the trend there uh, followed by the mean and the median. Um, with your really light events, less than uh, uh, 500 per hour, uh, you're basically looking at some, somewhere near one-to-one. -one. It may be even higher. So some of your, your drizzle, your very light freezing rain events, you're actually accreting, uh, uh, your ice efficiency is increased. 
but over time, you can see it decreasing here. Uh, when you get up to over 1,500 per hour, you're dealing with uh, ratios less than uh, half to one, uh, 0 0.5 to one. So there's a really significant decrease as, as you do that. But um, uh, in the lower, lower uh, left-hand corner here, it's the same graph, but just using that conversion to, to radial ice. So it's just showing you the, uh, the trends there as, as far as those numbers are concerned on the, on the graph here on the left-hand side. The other one was, well, I want to go back to this. Most likely we thought this was probably due to the fact that you get uh, runoff during some of these high precipitation, high precipitation rates. Uh, so you just don't have enough time to accrete the ice before more liquid is added and therefore probably increasing the likelihood of, of runoff to occur. And that's what we deemed uh, probably the physical thing that's taking place there. As far as wind speed's concerned, uh, wind's important during freezing rain. It removes heat from the uh, surface of the ice. It also promotes um, evaporation of what hasn't frozen yet and, and things like that. Uh, but what we notice in the trends is that you really don't see uh, much of an increase in the ratios uh, until you get to wind speeds maybe around 12 knots or greater. And even then, uh, you're sort of dealing with a large spread here. Uh, you're only dealing with what is uh, 56 hours worth of uh, freezing rain, which had an average wind of 15 knots or greater. Uh, I forgot to point out that's the number of hours here in the, bot in the uh, parentheses. But yeah, so most of these events are light wind events under 10 knots. So you're maybe not dealing with, a, with that, but when you do have some events that have <clears throat> excuse me, higher wind speeds, you're probably going to have uh, an increase in your ratios. We, we did analyze both wet bulb temperature as well as air temperature, and the, the correlation or the, the pattern was similar, the trend. Uh, but what we noticed with the wet bulb temperature is we had, we had 405 hours in which the temperature was 32 or above, and that's air temperature. But when we looked at the wet bulb for all those events, we only had 15 of them which were 32 or above. So it seemed like that wet bulb was a really good discriminator in just get, getting freezing rain to actually occur, or to actually get ice accretion to occur. So we thought that was a good, good way, um, a really strong signal there. And, and it makes sense physically uh, what's going on there with evaporation and cooling and whatnot. And the trend here, uh, temperatures uh, decreasing from uh, right to left. Uh, but near freezing, is what we notice is your ratios are low. I mean, you're looking at um, uh, ratios more like uh, 0.5 to 1. And which, which makes sense is you're probably just, your icing efficiency isn't as good. Uh, you're probably allowing more to run off. And, and um, you're dealing with latent heat. Uh, released during the ice accretion process, so that's probably something that the, the near freezing uh, temperatures are fighting here. Uh, but as your temperatures decrease, you get towards your negative one, negative two, negative three, your ratios do increase. I mean, there's a lot of overlap here, but just looking at the trends of the median and both the mean, you're getting closer back to you know point point eight or, or a, a one to one ratio. Uh, which, which highlights, you know, that, that some of these events that are 27, 28 degrees are probably going to accrete more ice than these near freezing temperatures. So we thought these were good results. Um, oh, yeah, one more thing I wanted to point out. Sorry, Brian stopped me there. Uh, is when you get to like negative three, negative four wet bulb or less, you actually see a sort of a trend of a decrease in the ice-liquid ratio there. Uh, the one thing we can contribute that to possibly being sleet, uh, some sort of mix not picked up by the weather sensor. We don't know how common that is, uh, but obviously if you're adding sleet and freezing rain, uh, your, your actual liquid, <coughs> liquid ratio is going to drop off there. So unless anything, anyone else has a different idea of why that's occurring, but in general when you get to negative four degrees, you're probably dealing with more of a sleet situation anyway, as opposed to freezing rain. So not much of a too too big of a we weren't too concerned there with that one. Uh, but we felt overall 
all these trends really made sense physically. So then we thought, well, what if we put together some sort of uh, uh, model that would utilize each of these ratios? Uh, and that's where I'll let Brian sort of step in and take over here. Yeah, are there any, any questions up to this point? I don't even know if you all can, uh, can, can have the possibility of talking here, but um, if there are any questions, feel free to fire away. Um, and if not, we can keep on moving towards our, our model that we developed. I'll assume by the silence we've got no questions. That's good news. Um, all right, here, and if you hear any background noise, uh, sorry about that. We're actually holding down shift here. We're both working the, uh, the forecast desk today, too, so fun times up in, up in Steve's Kansas. Um, but what we're talking about today is ice instead of the beautiful weather out there. And what we did from, uh, from the point where Chris left off, we ended up um, basically developing regression equations for each one of these three key elements that go into the forecasting of ice. Um, each individual regression had to fit the data well, but it also had to be meteorologically reasonable. Uh, for instance, um, statistically speaking, the uh, output that you would have gotten from the wet bulb temperature regression uh, had a little curly Q up here. That doesn't make any sense physically, uh, so we added uh, one more level of the polynomial so that it would uh, lean down. And, and statistically, that's fine, but if you're going by a pure statistician, they would say, well, why did you add that extra level? Well, it, it was because we were, were meteorologists and not statisticians, and the data fit what the data need to fit. Um, bottom line, though, all of these had, um, had you know, basic knowledge of statistics and also meteorology go into them to create these. Uh, and they did fit the data quite well, although, as you saw, there's a fair spread to all, all these data points along the way. Um, after we did that, we got to uh, discussing, you know, we could equally weight all of these, but we knew just anecdotally that certain things were more important. For instance, precipitation rate had the strongest signal by far for all of this. So we wanted to analyze, well, how should we weight these equations? How should we incorporate these into the model? Uh, what we ended up doing was uh, taking each individual regression and analyzing it at 1% weighting individuals, or inter intervals, excuse me, until every possible combination was analyzed. And I've got a little you know, chart here just to show you. Um, you know, 98%, 1%, 1%, and then we, we, we did every possible combination, I guess is what I'm showing you here. Um, and we ran that through a script in the background. And what we did was we did a reverse forecast with all of these uh, against 1,161 icing observations. Uh, the reason the number is smaller there is because we actually pulled out a control group of uh, 20 cases. We'll talk about that in the next couple slides. But we didn't want those cases to influence the model because that's what we were going to test the model against. Uh, so we ended up doing a reverse forecast against these 1,161 independent icing observations. And then the combination, the weighting combination that produced the lowest mean absolute error in those reverse forecasts was deemed as the optimal combination uh, for our model. Um, we got to thinking a little more beyond that, though. Um, maybe uh, for the data as a whole, uh, this weighting combination was the best, but what if we did some bin analysis and looked at just events where the wind speed was a greater than X or the wet bulb was less than X, et cetera. Um, so we went through and we you know, wrote some more scripts and analyzed a bunch of these binned uh, data sets. Without getting too complicated, uh, what we came up with was a, another slight improvement on our numbers um, by using the following strategies. And basically, when the wet bulb is greater than negative 0.35 Celsius, uh, we found it beneficial to use this uh, weighting strategy, a 0.7 for the precip rate, 29% uh, for the wet bulb ratio, and then 1% for the wind because it just didn't have as much of an impact at that point. When the wet bulb temperature was less than that 0 0.35 and the wind was greater than 12 knots, if you recall the previous chart, it showed that the wind didn't have much impact until it got stronger. And so what we found was the most beneficial cutoff for this was right at 12 knots where we actually would give much less weight to the wet bulb ice to liquid ratio equation and quite a bit more weight to the wind speed of part of that equation. And then finally, for all of the other events we used, uh, it ended up being exactly the same as, as our base level. But um, you can see the importance of the precip rate in all of this as getting 79% of the weight, 20% from the wet bulb, and then 1% from the wind speed.
part of the uh, ice-liquid ratio equation. Um, and if you have any questions later on, write them down and we'll try and answer them. I know that I'm kind of breezing through this, but uh, we talked about those 20 randomly selected freezing rain events that we used to test this. Um, and by the way, wherever you see FRAM from here on out, it's freezing rain accumulation model. Uh, FRAM, I guess it'll, it's a <laughs> fine acronym as we, as we do. Uh, anyway, uh, the event was defined as uh, a period of more than three hours or greater than or equal to three hours of continuous freezing rain. Um, no temporal gaps of ASOS were recorded, or, excuse me, no temporal gaps of ASOS recorded precipitation greater than one hour within the event, and no gaps of recorded freezing rain greater than 12 hours. So, for instance, we had to have individual hours of continuous freezing rain, but an event could be something where you had freezing rain for four hours, the temperature warmed up for four hours, and then you had freezing rain for four more hours. And that, we just put it together into a single eight-hour freezing rain event uh, just to have something good to, to test against. Um, we gathered a randomly selected database of 20 of these events that satisfied the criteria, which totaled out to 94 hours. Uh, as a whole, they had ice accumulations per event that ranged from 500 of ice to 5,700 of ice. Um, you can see a, a quick look at the forecast results. Uh, we compared all of these to the Krell simple model and also to just a simple one-to-one -one ice to liquid ratio uh, forecast conversion. Uh, and just as a note, the simple model results were converted to the same sort of measurement, the elevated horizontal ice uh, using the equations you saw earlier, the theoretical uh, conversion, we should say. Uh, the black line here indicates a perfect forecast, where your uh, model predicted ice on the y-axis was the same as the observed ice on the uh, x-axis. Uh, the FRAM results are in blue, and you can see that they are all fairly close to the line. You can also see a one-to-one ice-to-liquid ratio tended to overestimate, as you would expect based on what we saw from all the data. And the Krell simple model on the whole uh, in the pink here tended to massively overestimate, which we had seen anecdotally in, in just using the simple model in previous cases. Um, let's see here. And if we go forward to uh, another way to visualize this, again, the FRAM is in blue. And this is the absolute error in inches of ice uh, from the forecast. Um, you can see the, the blue lines all tend to be smaller for the most part. And that's because the FRAM ice predictions were superior to the other two methods in 17 of the 20 events, um, with a mean absolute error across those 20 events of 0.046 inches of ice. Um, both the Krell simple model and a one-to-one -one ratio overestimated. Uh, almost, almost every single event were overestimated, uh, not quite. <coughs> Excuse me. And those overestimations uh, tended to actually increase with higher amounts of icing. So what do we do from there? Well, uh, we wanted to put it into something we could use in our forecast process. So um, we're working on hopefully developing uh, some elements in D2D uh, here in, in the near future within AWIPS so that we can visualize this on a, on a plane. But also, uh, Eric Wise down at Springfield has been helping us out by uh, putting together a, a freezing rain procedure and smart tool set. Uh, it is being uh, evaluated, but it's close to done. Uh, as far as we can tell, at least the, the guts are there and the equations are in and it's working. Um, it's based on the FRAM, of course, and it's best utilized during freezing rain since that's what our research focused on. Um, input grids include the temperature, uh, weather grid, the wind speed, uh, dew point, wet bulb, QPF, and pop. And that can be any, any interval of QPF grid. Uh, and then it outputs an hourly ice accumulation, hourly flat ice accumulation hourly line ice accumulation, and then it sums them back into six hourly grids as well for the, the ice, the ice flat, and the ice line accumulation. So we're, we're trying to come at it from a, a, a lot of different angles here and make sure that we can get out what we need to get out. Um, we also included just a slider bar uh, as a method to reduce ice accumulation by a user-selected percentage for mixed precipitation areas. So it looks at your weather grids, says, OK, you've got freezing rain and sleet, or freezing rain and, and rain. And then it, uh, as a default, uh, hacks your RAM output by a certain percentage. So now we've got the model. We've got the, the data set. We've got the tools in GFE. Um, now I guess it comes to the next step of 
of talking about what we're forecasting. Um, and this is, I'm sure, something that you guys have all talked about a ton, and I know we've sure thought about it here a whole lot. Um, you know, it starts out with IT roadways, which what matters there is basically losing friction. Either you have it or you don't. Uh, it only takes a small amount to go from no impacts to high impacts, as we all know. And, you know, we've talked to the Kansas DOT here, and, and as a general rule, total ice amounts just aren't that important uh, when compared to location, coverage, timing, and duration. Uh, they're going to use a lot of the same treatments based on amount. Um, and it's something also that we don't forecast how they're going to treat these things. So um, we forecast some of the elements that go into it, but it depends on both surface air and soil temperatures, solar insulation, heat fluxes, uh, is the surface elevated or non-elevated? Are there chemicals there? Is it exposed to wind, traffic? So many things. And a lot of these things we don't forecast, I think, is the point that we're, that we're getting to here. Um, you know, and, and then we've got our definition of ice accumulation. And uh, it's the expected average of new ice accretion on all exposed surfaces. And that's really tough um, because it, in terms of a definition, I think it leaves a lot of wiggle room to the effect that maybe we don't really know exactly what we're forecasting. Um, and we, we all know what our advisories and warnings are done for. You know, a, a quarter inch of ice generally is an ice storm warning, but is that radial ice? Is it flat ice? Is it an average of all surfaces? And I'm not quite sure how to average that. So these are things we've been thinking about here, and that's for sure. And we, Chris especially has been looking at this and, and looking at past ice storms and put together some numbers and you know, when it comes down to it, if you look in the blue box here, if you have an elevated radial ice accumulation of a quarter inch, that's usually, as far as he could tell and as, as far as I've seen, when you start to get some of that damage to trees and power lines. Uh, of course, there are a few other elements that go into there, like winds and whatnot. But, but still, that's usually when you tend to get some damage. Um, at the same time, if you call that an elevated flat ice accumulation, that's 65 hundredths of ice. So I guess the question just comes back around to what are we really measuring here? And then what our results have shown is that you know for a typical liquid amount to get a quarter inch of, of radial ice on trees and power lines, you need about 90 hundredths of rain on average. Uh, so these are all just things that we've seen and we've been thinking about. And it, it kind of begs a few questions that we hope are, are really, I'm sure you all are discussing at the same time. And hopefully we can move forward with some of those in the future. And, and, you know, we, we really feel pretty confident about the results and what they're showing here um, and how these impacts kind of line up and, and, and that it would really benefit things to, to nail down what we're doing. Um, so just as a summary of the research, you know, we performed an in-depth analysis as a large objective and geographically diverse data set, 1,200-plus uh, hours of freezing rain observations. Uh, precipitation rate, wet bulb temperature, and wind velocity had the greatest impacts that we found on icing efficiency. Uh, we used the data to develop the freezing rain accumulation model. I was tested against the Krell simple model and just a plain one-to-one -one ice to liquid ratio. Uh, and it outperformed uh, those methods in 85% of the events with a mean absolute error, again, of less than 5 hundredths of ice per event. And the bias of uh, near zero it was like 0 .004 hundredths of an inch, something like that. Uh, the Krell simple model mean absolute error, just for reference, was 22 hundredths and almost exclusively high bias. And the one-to-one -one was uh, almost 12 hundredths and, again, almost an exclusively high bias. So overall, you know, we've got a, a GFE procedure set uh, that's been developed and uh, is almost ready to be rolled out if anybody's interested in it. Um, we're, we're still doing a little bit of testing and a little bit of development, but it's nearly complete. Um, you know, it's, it's important not only on the whole, but also just for our for our smart tool set here uh, to decide what type of icing we're really forecasting so that we can make sure that we're outputting the right thing into our ice accumulation grids and the NDFD. Um, and then also uh, identifying what icing magnitude causes various impacts and, and should pro uh, prompt our product issuances within the NDFD. Um, in terms of future work, you know, we're hoping to hoping get a chance to get a between chance. Uh, weather events you know, coming up to look a little further at ratios during mixed precipitation and also during freezing drizzle. And they're, they're noisier data sets for sure, but we've got a lot of the data to look at. So we're hoping to, again, look more in depth at that. And uh, I think that's where we are right now. And thanks again for your time and for, for joining us here.